what we are told is that these exit polls are not designed in the United States to be verifiers of the vote counts. Only in foreign countries are they designed to be verifiers of the vote counts. I'm Bonnie Faulkner. Today on Guns and Butter, Jonathan Simon. Today's show, Fingerprints of Election Theft. Jonathan Simon is Executive Director of the Election Defense Alliance, a nonprofit organization founded in 2006 to restore observable vote counting and electoral integrity as the basis of American democracy. He has published, both individually and in collaboration, numerous papers related to various aspects of election forensics and election integrity. He has worked in cooperation with many election integrity organizations, appeared in several election integrity related films, including Stealing America, Vote by Vote, and Uncounted, The New Math of American Elections. He is the author of Code Red, Computerized Election Theft and the New American Century. Jonathan Simon, welcome. Thank you, Bonnie. It's great to be here. Wonderful to have you back. The last time we spoke was after the 2014 midterm elections. And so now here we are after the 2016 presidential elections. What is the difference between voter fraud or voter suppression and computerized election theft? These are two different ways of rigging elections. Would you call voter suppression the old-fashioned way? Okay, well, you mentioned actually three things there that need to be distinguished, and I'll take them in order, in the order that you mentioned them. Voter fraud uh, is the idea that an individual voter, whether because they take it in their own head um, or because they're being paid or in some way influenced, goes in and attempts to vote twice or three times or ten times, vote as if they had a different name, uh, vote in two different states, something along those lines. And that was what um, Donald Trump, in, in his you know pre-election raising of the alarm, uh, brought up as being most prominent. And in fact, that is virtually non-existent. Uh, the cases can be counted on uh, a hand or two. The Knight uh, Foundation, I think, did a study where out of a billion ballots cast, they found exactly 10 cases of impersonation voting, which is what voter fraud is, is code for. So that was a red herring, and it was a canard, and it was something that um, Trump, in a very self-serving way, uh, was using as a, as a kind of wild card that uh, if he lost the election, they'd be going out and claiming that there was millions and millions of people uh, committing voter fraud. Basically, not only no evidence of it, but research done to show that it, it's very, very rare and doesn't influence the outcome of major elections. Voter suppression, on the other hand, is an inside game. Uh, voter suppression consists of disenfranchising large swaths of voters, whether by making it difficult for them to get IDs that are then made necessary to vote, um, closing up polling places and consolidating them so that you might have to drive three miles to vote as opposed to walk two blocks. Uh, when you got to your polling place, you'd find a very, very long line because 20 polling places have been combined in one, uh, shortening early voter hours, making it more difficult to get voter information, get ballots, and then this operation called cross-check and other uh, related operations that basically scrub voter rolls based on computerized program that not only uh, takes uh, felons off of the voter rolls but takes uh, – people who have the same name in two different states or have a similar name in two different states. Uh, and, of course, the names that are targeted are most often the constituencies that whoever is putting these programs in place do not want to see allowed to cast a vote. So you have people who have not committed felons, but they might both be named Willie Green. One might be Willie G. Green. The other might be Willie M. Green. Both are scrubbed. The felon is not allowed to vote, sometimes by law, uh, sometimes their rights are not restored, but the other person didn't do anything. And they come down to the poll and they find that their name was scrubbed. And this is the kind of thing that is done by the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. Greg Palast has done great work in exposing this. Unfortunately, it hasn't been remedied. And these are the kinds of schemes that can really reverse the outcome of elections because you're talking about thousands and thousands of people. Um, machines that don't count 
uh, votes. They take certain ballots and nullify the vote and call it an undervote. Uh, we're seeing that in Michigan, 90,000 undervotes in a state that is uh, where the margin is about 10,000 votes um, in the presidential election. So there are, various, there are various schemes, but the voter suppression schemes are pretty much overt. You know when you've not been allowed to vote for the most part. You know when you've been handed a provisional ballot that you suspect may not be counted. You know when you've been taken off the voter rolls and told you're not registered, go home. Computerized election rigging is more nefarious um, in many ways, and one of them is that you don't know. You cast your ballot, you put your ballot into the optical scanner, you touch your chosen candidates on the screen, and you walk away believing that your vote will be counted, and that, of course, everybody else's vote will be counted. And you have no idea if those votes were then switched, flipped, deleted, whether 10,000 votes were added. Um, you just don't know what's happening in a dark place in cyberspace. And that's the real pernicious part of it, is that there's no no way of, of reacting to that. If you were using an ATM computer uh, at a bank and you put your check in, you'd eventually get, you'd get a receipt for one thing, and then you'd get a bank statement. And if your check didn't show up, you'd go down to the bank and you'd raise holy hell. And so would everybody else whose checks didn't show up. They'd be put on notice. Voting doesn't work that way. Once you cast the vote, you have no way as of now of tracking that vote. And you certainly can't track the general aggregate of votes. Um, so it becomes a very, very easy game to just program those machines to alter vote counts pretty much at will. So the numbers that can be involved when you target that are very uh, significant numbers and they have the impact of being able to reverse election outcomes up and down the ballot, House, Senate, presidential, state houses, um, even judgeships. Mark Crispin Miller has said that it's okay to talk about voter suppression, but not about electronic vote theft. Why do you think this is? First of all, it is true. It is okay to talk about voter suppression, as you can tell. I mean, there's, there's plenty of... Uh, coverage of that in in the media electronic vote theft is one of those third rails i mean it's it's right up there with 9-11 and the jfk assassination um it's one of those things where we're supposed to take um entirely on faith and when you begin to look under the hood when you begin to question you're opening a real real um uh rabbit hole as far as what's really going on, we're not supposed to know. We're the public. We're supposed to uh, we're supposed to accept and we're supposed to trust. And I know you know it sounds very much conspiracy theory to say uh, what's really happening. We don't trust. Uh, we suspect. As I said, you know it's it's the untouchable. It's the unmentionable because it is so deep and it is so dark and it is so secret. And it would throw a, a lurid light of distrust and disbelief onto our entire electoral system, political system, and basically our democracy. That is a, a dangerous thing to do, nonetheless, if the choice is between that or continuing to live out a distorted historical lie in which our politics gets warped um, further and further you know, away from the truth, and we lose our sovereignty as a public, in my mind that's a, a far worse outcome and therefore we have to be brave and we have to look at this system and above all we have to reform it and restore an observable vote counting process that actually can earn the trust of the public rather than just demanding it how reliable are exit polls are they the gold standard of election monitoring how important are measures of voters intent such as exit polls pre-election polls post-election polls and hand counts well leaving the hand counts out of it and just looking at all the various polling uh, measures they are controversial and it is indirect evidence of the vote counts and unfortunately, it's the best evidence we have um, because all the hard evidence, by which I mean voter marked ballots, memory cards, doing the counting, the programming of those cards, the code on them, all of that is off limits to public knowledge, to public investigation. 
And so we're left with all these indirect means of checking. That's what we do. We do election forensics. And yes, these exit polls are strongly relied upon in foreign countries around the world, but have somehow managed when they cross the, the geographical border of the United States to be constantly off in the same direction and therefore discredited because the official story is that the vote counts are gospel, and we're not going to question those. So if the exit polls and the vote counts don't agree, even though it happens election after election, and even though it's virtually always in the same direction, well, it must be that there's something wrong with the exit polls. And so we're going to discount them, and we're going to move on, folks. If this election, November 2016, had occurred in a foreign country, if it occurred in the Ukraine or Kenya or Uzbekistan or in those places around the world where the United States, you know, has the geopolitical interest. And this election with these kind of exit poll disparities had occurred in one of those countries. The United States would have been in there the morning after demanding recounts, demanding redos of the election and saying whoever was elected assuming they were not the person we wanted to see elected, um, was elected illegitimately. And we would have been in there with all the force uh, that we have gone into other countries saying this has to be examined and investigated. Unfortunately, this is the United States of America. We're the beacon of democracy, and we don't dare question the same kind of data uh, does not uh, provoke any such type of further investigation, even though there are red flags flying all over the place. And what about exit poll data? Is it kept intact or is it massaged? Well, we have what we call the adjusted exit polls, which keeps us up at night on election night, uh, because if you were to look the next day, uh, you'd see exit polls that absolutely match the vote counts, pretty much congruent straight down the line. And that's because they're adjusted to match the vote counts. It's called a forcing process, and basically the who did you vote for percentage in the exit poll is forced to match the um, the vote counts. And uh, everything else is pulled along with that, all the cross tabs, all the party ID, age, race, gender, previous votes in previous presidential elections, all of that information gets put through that weighting process and is altered by this adjustment process. So those exit polls, which are considered to be very, very useful for academic analysis, because after all, they match the vote counts, therefore they're accurate, and now we can tell how many Republicans there were, how many Democrats, how many, you know, 25 to 35-year-olds or 39-year-olds, and uh, what they felt about the economy and when they made up their minds, all that is considered very accurate. Unfortunately, it's all been distorted from the actual um, responses to the exit polls. What we try to download is the first public posting of the exit poll before it's been overly contaminated with the vote counts. And the reason we do that is that once it's been contaminated with the vote counts, it doesn't serve as a very good verifier of the vote counts. What we are told is that these exit polls are not designed in the United States to be verifiers of the vote counts. Only in foreign countries are they designed to be verifiers of the vote counts. But for all sorts of uh, specious reasons, it doesn't work that way in the United States, so we can't use them that way. Well, we take that with a grain of salt. We download them anyway. We see what we come up with, and lo and behold, election after election, we come up with basically uh, the same directional pattern, which is that the vote counts shift to the right uh, relative to the exit polls, and this is in general elections, it shifts from the Democratic candidate to the Republican candidate. In primary elections, it shifts from somebody like Bernie Sanders to somebody like Hillary Clinton, the person that you'd look at and say, okay, this is who Karl Rove, or this is who the corporate establishment, this is who the right-wingers of the world want to see elected, and that vote count shifts from what we saw in the exit polls. I'm speaking with author and researcher Jonathan Simon. Today's show, Fingerprints of Election Theft. I'm Bonnie Faulkner. This is Guns and Butter. The exit polls are not perfect. No individual exit poll is perfect. But we try to do analyses, and we, we work really hard to try to validate the exit poll baseline and show that its demographics, the women versus men in the sample, the old versus young, the 
people of color versus white voters, uh, Republicans, independents, and Democrats. We try to show that those are valid. And if they're not valid, we ourselves question the exit poll. But when we're able to show that they're valid relative to other measures of the electorate that are undertaken by institutions like the University of Michigan or the Census Bureau, and we combine uh, as much of that information as we can, and we see that the exit poll uh, samples are valid, uh, or if anything, often are slightly uh, canted uh, to the right, then we know that we're dealing with a valid baseline. And when the votes, uh, vote counts depart from that baseline by large amounts, large disparities, such as we just saw this past Tuesday, um, it is a major red flag. Um, does it prove that the election was stolen? Not exactly. But it does say that there's ample reason to uh, be concerned and to pursue a deeper level of investigation, which would include audits and recounts, um, hold up the process of certification and the coronation of the supposed winner. And this goes for whether it's president or House member or state House member. Um, hold up that process until these vote counts can be verified. Unfortunately, in some cases, they can't be verified because they are done on paperless touchscreen machines, and there is literally no record other than what the programmer uh, has going on inside the machine. But in many cases, they can be verified. The voter mark ballots do exist, and the tragedy is that those ballots are almost never, 99.9% .9 of the time, no matter how suspect an election, they do not see the light of day. So we have an actual record there. It is off limits to inspection. It does not see the light of day. We are trying to make sure that in this election, and we tried in the primaries as well, that it does see the light of day, that there is a mass movement to um, explore and investigate, recount, and look at those actual ballots so that we actually have what would be in essence, an observable vote counting process. Our main vote counting process, our election night vote counting process, is absolutely not observable. It's taking place in the darkness of cyberspace. We want to have an observable process. We need to have an observable process in order to have any true legitimacy to the outcome of our elections. You write that in 2016, our analysis of the respective party primaries found that while the exit poll results were consistently accurate throughout nearly all of the Republican primaries, they were wildly and broadly inaccurate in the Democratic primaries, exhibiting a pervasive intra-party redshift to the detriment of Bernie Sanders. Was there a glaring divergence between the Democratic primary election results in primary versus caucus states? Okay, that again is two separate things. Those are two separate red flags, and they're both very bright red flags uh, over the primaries. Um, the first was that if you look at the caucus states, versus the primary states. After the initial two caucuses, Iowa and Nevada, which were both very, very close outcomes, and uh, that was sort of before the Bernie uh, Sanders campaign was, was hitting on all cylinders. After that, there were 12 more caucus states, and Sanders won those caucuses by an average of 36.6% of the vote count. That is more than a landslide. That is, that is a whooping. That's a rout. And he won every single one of them. And there, you know, caucuses are, are, uh, involve a vote counting process that is, for the most part, observable. Basically hand counting, people in a room. It also does involve a different electorate, more motivated voters. Um, it's not an exact parallel with primaries. Um, but that kind of um, extreme divergence, um, when you're looking at the votes being counted observably versus in the primaries when they were counted on computers, that was an, an absolute blazing red flag. Um, you know, again, you, you can come up, if you work at it, uh, for benign explanations for uh, almost any red flag, and sometimes they are true. 
Um, but when you look at so many red flags, and I'm talking about over the course of the 15 or 16 years since the computers have been in, it would be uh, quite improbable that all the benign explanations are true and that none of the uh, malignant explanations are true. So that was the caucus versus the primary, and it was glaring. Then within the primaries themselves, there were exit polls done uh, on those primaries, and they had a very different uh, set of uh, results in terms of accuracy. In the Republican uh, primaries, with the exception of two states, there were more than 20 other states where the exit polls uh, were pretty much spot on. Uh, they were very, very close to the vote counts, and we measured it uh, in a number of different ways. And I, uh, probably the most useful way to measure it was Trump against the field, Trump against all the other candidates. And it was, it was very, uh, very accurate. Over in the Democratic side, in state after state after state, there was a shift from uh, Sanders to Clinton, Sanders doing better in the exit polls, Clinton doing better um, in the vote counts, very often well outside the margin. All this is you know, covered in code red. It's established data and pretty straightforward analysis. So the question became why, and this is what I call second-order uh, comparatives, um, because we're not just looking at a run of exit polls that were off. We're looking at exit polls for one party, exit polls for another party, same firm doing the polling, using the same methodology at the same precincts with the same interviewers on the same days. And on one set of primaries on the Republican side, they perform pretty much brilliantly, uh, very accurately. And on the other side, they look like a bunch of amateurs who don't know what they're doing. Um, you have this persistent uh, shift all in the same direction. So the Republican uh, performance of the exit polls on the Republican primary serve as a kind of uh, validator. Yeah, these guys did know what they were doing. They got 22 primaries basically spot on. So what happened on the Democratic side? So again, that becomes another uh, red flag. Uh, and there are other red flags flying over the primaries. It is difficult when you have a candidate uh, who is not willing to go to the mat, and that is probably, you know, 99% of the candidates are very inhibited uh, from coming out and crying foul. Uh, why? Because they have political careers to maintain, and the sore loser label and the entire media establishment comes crashing down on their heads. Um, it's a very intimidating thing. We've seen candidates do it in certain races, the uh, Supreme Court, uh, race in uh, Wisconsin was one example of that and get very much pilloried. We saw Al Gore uh, mount a challenge. He was the popular vote winner, uh, if we can recall, in 2000. So he had a pretty strong basis for that. And he lost the Electoral College through the state of Florida by uh, a tabulated margin of 537 votes, having won the national popular vote by half a million. And he took that, you know, through the courts. He was pilloried. He was holding up the country. He was exposing us to, um, you know, potential attack, et cetera, et cetera. So politicians are very reluctant. And Bernie Sanders was uh, followed suit in that regard. He did not even though he was uh, provided with much of this information, his campaign did not choose to take it to the next level and challenge some of these results. It is what it is. You know, we, we uh, provide this data and we provide the analysis uh, that could lead to uh, something very important, uh, which is potentially an exposure of fraudulent vote counting process, and it could then lead to a restoration of an observable vote counting process, which is what our real goal is. So we're not looking to rerun past elections. We're not saying, uh, you know, we're going to scrub the history books of George Bush's presidency. You know, Hillary Clinton, legitimately or not, was the nominee. Uh, we can't go back and rerun the primaries. And so we're looking prospectively to say we have to fix this system. Your book, Code Red, was updated for 2016, and that came out after the primaries, but before the presidential election. So you've done a lot of work on the primaries, and it's in your book, and I think it's very instructive 
for us to take a look at these primaries because you've included uh, so much work on it. So you have pointed out that the Republican primary looked unsuspicious. But let's take a look at this Democratic primary. You talk about the two Dakotas, the North Dakota and South Dakota. What went on in the Dakotas during the Democratic primary? Yes, that was another uh, red flag in, in the sense that one was a caucus and one was a primary on the same day. And, you know, they have very similar constituencies in the sense of racial composition and um, demographics in general. Uh, they're not identical, but they're very similar. And yet we saw a tremendous, tremendous disparity between results. I believe uh, in one state where the caucus was, it was a, a, a landslide for, for Bernie Sanders. And in the uh, other state, it was a very close election. So we saw a huge disparity in terms of the voting percentage, one state being essentially counted observably and the other state being counted unobservably by computers in the darkness of cyberspace. So, you know, that's the kind of thing that we look at and we say, okay, does it prove that the election was stolen? No. But does it impel us to do a deeper investigation, look at the actual ballots cast? Absolutely. And unfortunately, that's the kind of hard evidence that barring a huge press for it, a full court press, to get access to that evidence and even sometimes with a full court press that evidence is denied i mean the system was designed to conceal its inner workings and that is not compatible with a democratic system i'm speaking with author and researcher jonathan simon today's show fingerprints of election theft i'm bonnie faulkner this is guns and butter was Democratic primary exit polling canceled in any states? Basically what happened was that the results um, in state after state were so embarrassing uh, that the exit polls were canceled for about the, the final five states, including California, which uh, at that point was a very critical state and a very large one. Um, the exit polls were just, just done away with. Um, if you don't you know, like what's emerging from your from your secondary measurement, you just do away with it, kill the messenger. And that's exactly what happened in the primaries. Again, another red flag. Now, how can exit polling be canceled? Were, were these hired companies that were doing the exit polling? Yeah, exit polling is, is quasi-official. It's basically the, a consortium of the networks along with the AP, so it's uh, it's a small consortium, are the primary clients, and they hire the firm that's now Edison Research. Uh, at one time was Edison Matoski. Um, if they uh, decide they want to pull the plug on it, they're the ones who are paying the freight, and they pulled the plug on it. Now, you know why they did it? Uh, it looks pretty obvious. Exit polls have been cut back in general over the last three or four election cycles. This time, uh, I believe 23 states were not exit polled at all in the general election. I might have that number wrong. It might be 21 or so, but almost half the states. Now, granted, those were the states that were considered not to be particularly competitive in the presidential race or in the senatorial or gubernatorial races, but those are the very states that would serve as a baseline for us in doing forensic investigation. And what I mean by that is that if you have, as we did in 2004, basically all the states exit polled back in the old days, uh, they exit polled all of them. And if you see a pattern in which the red shift is uh, pronounced in the battleground states and does not exist uh, in the safe states, in this run of 20 or 25 safe states, um, that is another huge red flag. I mean, you know, if the exit polls can't get it right, why can they get it right in all these states that don't matter, where there isn't going to be any rigging because they're not even close, um, but they all of a sudden can't get it right in, in states that matter and that are going to determine the, the electoral college winner of the presidency. So we're seeing our data 
base being eroded steadily, and it makes it very difficult uh, to do reliable forensics. And again, you know, we work with whatever we can find, and we we have methods other than exit poll based. We looked at um, cumulative vote share patterns. We look, you might have uh, mentioned before, about hand counts, uh, where they're available, which is not much, but uh, there are some. Uh, we'll use every scrap that we possibly can find to try to establish whether an election was suspect or whether it looked to be accurately and honestly counted. Unfortunately, our options are pretty narrow, uh, and the best evidence, which is the actual voter mark ballots, the memory cards, uh, the code running on the computer, all that is strictly corporate, strictly proprietary, withheld from public investigation, withheld from the candidates, and often, in fact, withheld from election administrators themselves. So, as I said, the system was designed for concealment, uh, whether that was a nefarious design or just happened to serve the purposes of those who would manipulate it, I don't know. But the fact is, it was designed for concealment, and it's working very well if that is the intention. If voting machines are going to be rigged, we're talking about electronic voting machines, how far in advance of the vote does this have to be done? You write that forensic analysis strongly suggests that election rigging has evolved into what might best be described as a two-tiered strategy consisting of preset and real-time manipulations. Could you explain this? Um, if you're approaching rigging from a rigger's standpoint, there's an algorithm. There's a risk-reward algorithm. Uh, this is our goal. We want to, you know, capture the political system. Uh, we need this, 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 and this election, um, but we're also uh, inviting potential uh, investigation and exposure if we go too far, uh, if results don't pass the smell test. And so there's a risk-reward calculation there. And um, there's also the undervalued significance of down-ballot races, state houses, you take over state houses, you pass voter ID laws, you gerrymander ruthlessly and lock in all the incumbents that you got into office. Um, you pass laws that affect uh, election administration. You develop more and more control over the election process. So state houses are critical. The U.S. House of Representatives, the incumbency advantage is so huge there that once you get in, uh, it's hard to be forced out. Uh, we had an election in 2014 where uh, the congressional approval rating, remember the Republicans were in the majority at the time, uh, so it was basically a, an approval rating of them was in the single digits, 8% or so, um, 89% disapproval. And of 222 uh, Republican House members who stood for re-election, exactly two were defeated, uh, re-election rate of over 99%. So you have these, these down-ballot races that the public and the media don't scrutinize very much, but they are absolutely critical. But what is critical about uh, down-ballot races is often in the aggregate, which is to say you want to take control of the House. You don't necessarily want to win this particular race or that particular race. You have 40 competitive races. If you take 25 of them, that's what you're aiming for. Get 25 out of 40. For those kind of races... Preset rigs work just fine. And by a preset rig, I mean a memory card, a memory card on which you've done something uh, like shift the zero counters so that the candidate you want to win gets a plus 100. This first ballot counts as 101. The candidate you want to lose gets a minus 100. First ballot counts as minus 99. End of the day, 1,000 people come in, vote 500, 500. You've shifted a net of 200 votes. The candidate you want to win uh, gets 600. The candidate you want to lose gets 400. But it looks like the right number of people have voted, matches the poll books. Election administrator looks at it, sees a clean election, certifies it. That's a preset rig. There are many other types of preset rigs you can do, but it's basically embedded on the memory card. And the only real downside of that is you kind of have to guess in advance 
how many votes you need. If you take too many, it begins to uh, maybe perhaps not pass the smell test. If you don't take enough, you don't alter the result. So you have a ballpark idea of how many votes you need. Well, when you're trying to capture a state house in a given state or capture the House of Representatives, you just need a batting average. So you can afford to be off on a certain percentage of the calculations you made about what kind of manipulation, uh, how many votes to steal, basically. So that will work. A preset rig will work very well in those cases, and you can put it in once the candidates are uh, identified. You can actually put it into the underlying code on these computers such that before the candidates are identified, the code will then identify the Democratic and Republican candidates and shift votes accordingly. So you can literally put it in when the machine is manufactured and distributed or when the memory card is manufactured well in advance of the election. And those those work quite well. But for high volatility, high profile elections such as the presidency, uh, where it's very close and it's very fluctuating, you need a better indication of what states you have to take and how much you have to shift, and there's going to be more scrutiny. So what we saw, for instance, in the 2004 election was a man-in-the-middle attack in the state of Ohio. What happened was Carl Rove's IT guru, uh, Mike Connell, the late Mike Connell, I should say, um, set up servers in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And if you remember, the uh, the control of the Ohio process was in the hands of Ken Blackwell, now a member of the Trump administration. And uh, he was also a honorary chairman of the Bush campaign. So <laughs> there was a fair amount of conflict of interest. But these servers went down. On, on election night, uh, around 11 p.m., and they went they went offline, and the votes were shunted uh, through cyberspace, through, through the way computers move data, over to Mike Connell's smart tech servers in Chattanooga, Tennessee, where they were processed, uh, and I use that word, you know, with a certain italization, and then they were sent back into the Ohio computers. So that was what you call a man-in-the-middle attack. You take the data, you alter the data, you send it back in. They tried the same thing, and that's what I call a real-time rig, because you can calibrate it. Oops, we're losing by 136,000 votes. Let's move 160,000 votes. We're losing by 136,000 votes, and the mandatory recount uh, margin would be 40,000 votes. All right, let's move 177,000 votes and avoid the mandatory recount margin. That is real-time rigging. It's man-in-the-middle rigging. And we saw an attempt at that. Um, in the 2012 election, and that was signified, if you remember, by Karl Rove's very memorable, what is now, you know, generally referred to as his meltdown on Fox News. And he was basically disputing the call of Ohio and the election for Obama by his own very conservative network. And he was saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, what are you guys doing? We don't have the full data. There are more votes coming in. I'm seeing trends here. He was going on and on and on, basically humiliating himself and not a, a man who's apt to historically to humiliate himself, very, very shrewd and cautious. Um, what was going on in the background was that he had an operation called Orca, which was billed as a get out the vote operation, but also had its tentacles into the vote count database. And um, this operation was planned to uh, basically replicate what happened successfully in 2004. And Karl Rove was waiting for that to happen. But unbeknownst to him, after the untimely death of Mike Connell, he had to reconstitute his IT staff. Uh, and he brought in a bunch of people. And one of them uh, was at least... Um, according to Anonymous, with whom I've talked personally, uh, one of them was an infiltrator from Anonymous who got in, learned all the passwords, and on the election night in real time, basically counter-rigged, counter-thwarted the, uh, the rig that was, was scheduled to take place by locking Rove's operatives, uh, his, his tech people, out of their own program, out of their own servers. So they were scrambling around trying, I think it was 105 different passwords, and they couldn't get in, so they couldn't process the vote. Uh, and Karl Rove didn't know this, so he was 
basically temporizing and saying we were going to see uh, a different outcome. We were going to see uh, Romney win Ohio and win these other three states and win the presidency. So, you know, that is real-time rigging. Whatever happened in 2016, we don't know yet. It's way too early in the forensics game, and we may never know. It's hard to track these things down. We were very fortunate uh, to get a handle on it in 2004 through the inadvertent release of an IP address, and then again in 2012 uh, through the work of Anonymous. But it's the kind of thing that can happen when you have an unobservable, computerized, privatized, outsourced, networked vote counting system. And that's what we have. And it's vulnerable to outsider hacking. It's vulnerable to insider rigging. It's vulnerable to both happening at the same time. And then you get these numbers that come out and everybody says, amen, let's move on, when those numbers could be absolutely fictitious. I'm speaking with author and researcher Jonathan Simon. Today's show, Fingerprints of Election Theft. I'm Bonnie Faulkner. This is Guns and Butter. In your book, Code Red, you ask, how did we ever come to approve and accept such a dangerous system? How and when was electronic voting instituted? The Help America Vote Act, HAVA, was passed in 2002, creating a powerful mixture of incentives and mandates for states to rapidly computerize their elections. How did they get HAVA, this uh, Help America Vote Act, through? Well, in the aftermath of the 2000 election debacle, the public embarrassment of hanging chads, and there was that iconic photo of um, this guy looking through a, a magnifying glass and trying to determine this mark on a ballot. So it was set up perfectly to say, well, we can't have this anymore. We have to computerize. We have to modernize. There's a fair amount of evidence that the 2000 election, especially in Florida, was sabotaged deliberately to create a chaotic situation. Uh, the paper that was used in these uh, punch card uh, machines, and again, this is a fairly complex and deep story, but whether it was deliberately sabotaged or not, the fact is that uh, it became, you know, a no-brainer that we had to fix this system. And, of course, it was going to be fixed in the direction of progress. And also the disabled community and on the part of some in the disabled community um, who were also um, – basically shills for the computerized vote counting industry, and I'm thinking particularly of, of, of one person uh, that, that, you know, advocated very strongly, we have to have these machines, we have to have these, because there's no other way for disabled people to vote, and that was flat out not true. There are vote marking machines that are not computerized that would enable disabled people to vote just as well, but the agenda was to push these computerized machines. So you had this big groundswell, and it was basically the brainchild of Robert Ney, who was a uh, Republican congressman from Ohio and a rather corrupt one. Uh, he spent, I think, uh, the better part of three or four years in federal prison for corruption subsequently. But he and Mitch McConnell uh, and, and certain other uh, Republicans from their think tanks got together and started pushing this idea of computerized voting. And they sold it effectively to John Conyers and the Democrats with the teaser that it would improve and increase voting turnout. And that was always something that the Democrats, you know, they always want more turnout. And if I had been John Conyers, I would have been highly skeptical because the Republicans have done nothing for the last hundred years other than try to reduce turnout. And you would have said, well, why would the Republicans want to put in a system that cuts against them uh, by increasing turnout? And the reason, as far as we can tell, is that it also opened up all these gateways to computerized manipulation and that there was a knowledge uh, that these gateways would be open, that this would be a system that would be in the control of a, a handful of very partisan corporations, Diebold being one of them, ES&S being another. Uh, they knew that they'd be handing the vote counting system over, privatizing it and handing it over to these uh, companies with essentially a blank check to count however they damn pleased. So the impetus for passing HAVA 
in light of the debacle of 2000 was very great. It was passed without, you know, essentially any real significant debate, without any challenge, and we were launched. We were on our way within a couple of years. The states were incentivized to put in all these computers. They did, often without a whole lot of thought, uh, from this very, very small group, literally a handful or less, of vendors. And the rest is history. Uh, that's the way we've been counting our votes. In the beginning, it was more DREs, uh, which are touchscreen computers with no paper record. People rightly became very concerned when votes were swallowed by the thousands and there was no way of recovering them or recounting them. So there was this idea that if we just then verified voting has been very strong in this area. If we move to optical scanners, at least we'll have actual voter mark ballots that can then be recounted and audited, which is all great but it also serves as a kind of false assurance because the reality is that 99.9% .9 of the cases, even where elections are highly suspect, those actual voter mark ballots never see the light of day. An optical scanner is a computer. There are 500 to 700,000 lines of code on the memory card that runs an optical scanner. So these are computers as well. Basically, 98% of our vote counting system is now uh, fully computerized. And many of those computers, despite what you'll hear, that they're not networked, that's not true. They're equipped with modems. Once you're equipped with a modem, it becomes relatively simple to alter uh, these machines remotely. They might as well be fully networked. And some of the central tabulators uh, especially are fully networked. So we have basically a cyber system that is wide open to cyber theft, and we're seeing enough cyber theft out there now of all other types of data and information, and elections are basically the highest stakes game out there. Well, what about whistleblowers? Have we heard from any whistleblowers? We have. I mean, the whistleblowers, uh, some of them are uh, dead and rather suspiciously dead. Um, some of them were completely ignored. You have Clint Curtis, uh, who came out and testified under oath, passed lie detector tests, that he was commissioned to write a program uh, to flip the vote in Florida by uh, somebody who was at the time Speaker of the House of Florida, Republican. You have Mike Connell, who was testifying um, in a case that was investigating the theft of the election in Ohio in 2004. He had given a closed deposition, a sealed deposition. He was notified that he was going to um, be required to come back and complete that process and perhaps um, have it extend into open court. Uh, I emailed a colleague at the time, this was in November, literally the day before the 2008 election. I said, you know, the poor guy's never going to see Christmas. On December 19th, his plane went down. Uh, he was killed. They uh, cordoned off the site, much as they did with the Wellstone crash. Uh, it was not the FAA or the transportation people. It was the FBI. The uh, BlackBerry, the notorious BlackBerry that contained um, emails, <laughs> emails again, uh, between Connell and, and Karl Rove and uh, apparently thousands of, the, of emails, uh, was never found. Uh, but his widow combing the, the crash site uh, the following day found the earpiece to his BlackBerry. So he had it with him, and there it was, but no BlackBerry. That was that, that disappeared. So, uh, you know, this is what has become of whistleblowers. The reporter investigating um, the Clint Curtis allegations, he was uh, actually not a reporter. He was a member of the state investigatory unit. Um, at the time he was doing that investigation, uh, was found uh, dead in a bathtub in a hotel in uh, a neighboring state in Georgia. Um, it was attributed to suicide, but the photographs from the scene seem to show that he stabbed and beat himself to death. Um, not a not a very popular method of, of suicide. So, you know, you have some whistleblowers. You have uh, rather uh, chilling results uh, of some of those attempts. Um, and I also would want to make the point that to rig the elections in the United States, uh, contrary to popular belief, does not require a vast conspiracy because the computers, uh, although they're not federalized, but there are a very limited variety of equipment 
and national grade riggers know very well where the back doors are to these equipment, how to get into them. It really just requires a very, very, very small cohort. Um, really, essentially, and this has been shown by research, uh, Princeton, the Brennan Center at NYU, Johns Hopkins, um, Caltech, have basically demonstrated that a single person can change the results of hundreds of elections just by altering these memory cards and replicating these memory cards. So it doesn't require a vast conspiracy, and that's one reason why they don't have to worry too much uh, about a mass of whistleblowers coming forward. And of course, when those who have come forward wind up um, uh, either being ignored uh, or actually silenced, a significant damper on the enthusiasm for other potential people with knowledge of uh, what's happening to actually come forward. Who are the corporations that count our votes? Well, now we're getting into uh, the sort of bailiwick of deep investigation, but I can tell you who they are by name. Uh, Dominion, ES&S, Hard InterCivic, uh, SOE, Skytel, uh, basically cover, cover the ground. And most of that is Dominion and ESNS. Uh, Dominion was a Canadian outfit that took over most of the, um, equipment from Premier. And Premier was formally called Diebold Election Systems, which is probably the name that is most familiar to people. Um, the pedigree of these corporations, uh, is quite right wing. Uh, the Eurosevich brothers, uh, just before the George Bush era, uh, George Bush, the younger era, basically worked their way. They took family fortune, I think, and sort of bought their way into Diebold and ES&S, respectively, and took over operational control of these vote-counting corporations. And since then, uh, they've gone through many uh, name changes, these corporations, Diebold to Premier and then into Dominion, and some of their stuff got spun off to ES&S. Uh, but it's the same, when I say handful, I mean, you could count them on one hand, bunch of corporations that uh, manufacture the equipment and under them are a variety of regional uh, subcontractors or satellite corporations such as LHS in New England, uh, Command Central in uh, uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin and Triad in Ohio and the Midwest and all throughout the country that actually do uh, much of the programming specific to given elections. There's code on those machines that comes from the vendors, the manufacturers. There's layers of code that come from the satellite corporations. And the one thing that we know is that the election, actual election administrators, county election clerks, uh, secretary of states, uh, board of elections chiefs around the country, do not have access to this code. This code is considered corporate proprietary trade secret. And they also do not have the chops, our publicly elected administrators, uh, in the vast majority of cases, they do not have the chops to dig in and analyze that code. It takes uh, IT experts, and they rely on the vendors for this. So there's very, very little oversight. Yes, these machines can be tested, uh, but it is trivial, uh, trivially easy to program a machine to pass a pre-election test and then manipulate on the day of the election, then delete the code that was causing that manipulation, self-delete. So these tests are, are essentially worthless when it comes to putting a roadblock in front of any manipulator that was at, at all determined to work around it or get over it. Well, now, in closing, your graphs of the 2016 presidential election exit poll versus vote count comparison, the shift in certain states changed the outcome of entire states. And a lot of these states were... Twin states, battleground states. Battleground states, yeah. The election, yeah. Absolutely. And when, when you see this kind of pattern and, you know, there I was, it was about, uh, I, I basically had this chart completed by about one in the morning uh, Pacific time. Uh, and I looked at it and I said, well, here we go again. You know, we're looking at something very similar to 2004. Uh, we're looking at way more than enough electoral votes to swing the election coming from states that are suspect with red flags over them. And basically what we see is we see a comparison 
of the margin in the exit poll between, in the case of the presidential race, Clinton and Trump, the margin in the vote counts, and then the disparity between them. And the red shift is a positive number if the vote counts were more in favor of Trump than the exit polls. So if, if votes appeared to shift from the exit polls to the vote counts towards Trump, that is a positive number. And we go down the red shift and we see 11.6 percent, 10.7 percent, 8.5 percent, 7.9 percent, dot, 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 all positive numbers. Um, there are a couple of uh, very small negative numbers down at the bottom of the graph. But basically, all these battleground states, uh, Ohio, uh, Wisconsin, Colorado, uh, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Florida, New Hampshire, they're all experiencing um, red shifts, most of which are outside, uh, well outside the margin of error of these polls. So either the polls got it very wrong or there's uh, a problem with the vote counts. You know, it's one or the other. It's, this is not random chance. Um, and there are issues with polls. And when we see uh, patterns like this, you want to be able to rule out those issues. And that's part of the work we're doing now. Jonathan Simon, thank you very much. Thank you, Bonnie. Thanks for your continued interest and commitment and for opening these doors and helping people become more informed. Something happening, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What it is ain't exactly clear. There's a man with a gun over there. I've been speaking with Jonathan Simon. Today's show has been Fingerprints of Election Theft. Jonathan Simon has authored both individually and in collaboration numerous papers related to various aspects of election integrity. He serves as Executive Director of Election Defense Alliance, a nonprofit organization founded in 2006 to restore observable vote counting and electoral integrity as the basis of American democracy. He has appeared in several election integrity related films including Stealing America, Vote by Vote, and Uncounted, The New Math of American Elections. He is the author of Code Red, Computerized Election Theft and the New American Century. Jonathan Simon is a graduate of Harvard College and New York University of Law. He is admitted to the Bar of Massachusetts. He tweets at Jonathan Simon 14 and invites those interested in corresponding to connect with him through the Code Red website at coderead2016.com or at jscoderead2014 at gmail.com Guns and Butter is produced by Bonnie Faulkner, Yarrow Mako, and Tony Rango. Visit us at gunsandbutter.org to listen to past programs, comment on shows, or join our email list to receive our newsletter that includes recent shows and updates. Email us at faulkner at gunsandbutter.org Follow us on Twitter at GNB Radio.